confidence we won't lose everybody to sleep. So I'm going to start. Uh, my name's Steve Wally. I'm a distinguished technologist at uh, Hewlett Packard. Uh, as of next week, I'll be a distinguished technologist at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Uh, and I've been in the industry for about 35 years now. I've had the privilege of being both on the vendor side as well as on the customer side. I've worked in large IT organizations for a large part of my career. And my co-presenter? Um, I'm Leon. I work for Intel as a cloud architect. So I've been working in the, in the industry for about 15 years with a mixed background in software application development, infrastructure development, as well as operations. And before Intel, I worked for Liberty Mutual IT. So it's one of the insurance companies in the US, very big company in the US. And I also worked for a couple of companies, including Motorola, and also led the engineering team of a few startup companies. And um, back in 2013, I obtained my PhD in multi-cloud orchestrations. So we're talking about turning pets into cattle today. And I wanted to make sure, though, we do a quick base set on what we're not going to be talking about. So this is not a talk about how you're going to deploy those applications in any kind of continuous integration, continuous deployment situation, or how to automate those things. You know, this is not a talk about Puppet or Shelf or Salt or Ansible. You know, those are all good things. Those are all excellent practices. But those are also cultural practices between engineers and operations folks. And what we want to do is, we, this is, this is a talk about application architecture. And I'm sure everybody's familiar with the idea of pets and cattle. Uh, pet, pets were, are things with names. Uh, these are your traditional three-tier architected applications. They are highly managed. They're long running. I mean, we, we used to measure things in uptime, right? That was the important thing that we all cared about. Uh, a lot of people like to talk about this as your legacy. And that's, that's one way to think about it. But it's actually, these are your business critical applications. And then you contrast that with the cattle world. Uh, these are suddenly things that you can scale out. Uh, they're highly resilient. Uh, you can, if, if you lose a machine or you lose a piece of the application, there's enough redundancy built in that things just keep on working. Now, a lot of people are already doing the exploration into how they would build cloud native applications and how this is going to work forward. But that's the way you think about the applications that you are, you are building forward, how you're addressing your backlog. And what Leong and I want to talk about is how do you actually think about moving some of your pets and these highly managed workloads, these, these business critical applications, into a new cloud enabled world on OpenStack. Now, one of the things that you'll come across, uh, before we get too far, we will be publishing the slides, as well as the fact that the OpenStack uh, organization will be publishing all of the slides. We'll also turn around and we'll each publish the slides through our own uh, slide share and such. So you'll have access to all of any URLs that are mentioned here. Um, the, the URL at the bottom there, though, is, is an exceptionally good document at allowing you how to think about some of these issues. Um, and one of the things it presents is this idea of uh, cloud application maturity levels. The problem in this space, though, is it's always presented to people as if these are absolutes. You know, you're at level zero or you're at level two. And the thing that you need to think about when you start trying to understand how you're going to move your application workloads and, it, and how you're going to kind of forklift your business critical applications into an OpenStack cloud world is you can actually be at multiple different levels of maturity in each application. So we're, we're all probably, you know, if you're a, a Fortune 500 company, you, you are already a VMware customer. You know, we all understand virtualization and kind of level zero. Most of us have been living there for a long time. Um, when you start looking at level two, or sorry, level one and level two, that's some of the work that Leong's going to demonstrate in a minute. Um, it's how do you think about taking that three-tier application and begin to tear it apart in interesting ways without having to refactor it all. Um, when you finally start stepping up from kind of that level two to level three, we start talking about, you know, 
we, that's where you get into Netflix country. You know, everybody aspires to be Netflix. So it's, we're going to take this kind of to the next step, and Leong's going to be working with uh, WordPress, because that's an app, a three-tier application that everybody understands, and can, it works as a really good model to tease out the questions about how you have to think about re-architecting things. Yeah. So, um, okay, um, I believe most of us has come to um, been to the process of migration from physical environment into virtualization environment. So when we move our application from physical to virtualization environment, um, our application's architecture actually doesn't change too much. So traditionally, we used to have web clusters and application clusters and the DB clusters, but when we move into the virtualization environment, we tend to moving the same model into the virtualization world. So what we gain from this model, from P to V, is basically we maximize the resource utilizations on the machine level, and we probably can do some of the on-demand configuration by launch. You can launch your application in an on-demand on way. So that's why we go where, where we go from physical to virtualization P to V. But when we come into virtualization to cloud, we, we start wondering. I mean, um, can we do the same thing in in what we done what we have done in the in the P to V model? Can we do the using the same approach without changing or without re-architecting our, our application and move them into the cloud? That's what we call paths to cattle. So what are the things that we need to be done? I mean, uh, do we have to do re-architecture or can we just do port the whole VM over? So one thing I want to, before we dive deep dive into more uh, of the architecture design, I want to show you this diagram. And this is one of the diagrams that we borrow from the, um, recently we published a booklet called OpenStack um, from business perspective. So the, the documents, I mean, uh, is, is a collaboration work between HP, Intel, and other company in the in the foundation in the community, and the, the you can actually download the, the PDF file from um, openstack.org/enterprise. It's freely download, downloadable, so you can access that documents. And basically, what I'm trying to um, tell you here is that we need to understand first. We need to understand the differences between virtualization and cloud. As as you can see from the diagram here, on the Right hand side, okay, on your, your left hand side, okay, in the virtualization world, um, our applications tend to rely on the infrastructure to achieve high resiliency. So, relies on the hardware solutions, uh, replication, everything on hardware layers. And our application tend be, tends to be a scale up model. But when we come into the cloud based environment or cloud native environment, our application is designed in a distributed fashion. So, the application itself, a cloud native application, is responsible for their own resiliency mechanism. And it's kind of like independent, independent from the underlying infrastructure. If you're building a cloud native application, your application can run on private cloud or public cloud without too much changes. And the cloud native application is more API driven and is scaling horizontally. So, that's one of the key differences in between virtualization and, and cloud. And another thing I want to show is about the architecture design between conventional app and a cloud-aware app. So when we, when we design our application in the past, the application tends to be monolithic, centralized state, and very tightly coupled. And most of the requires tends to be synchronous. But when we come into cloud building cloud-aware application, we are thinking about building using distributed architectures or using microservices. And requires tends to be asynchronous. And the app itself is designed for failure. It can handle all kinds of failure situations. And basically, we're using kind of like share nothing architectures. And there's this, thing, there's this concept about eventually consistent. So these are the design considerations when coming to the differences, differences between conventional application and cloudware applications. So uh, just now, uh, Steve also mentioned about these uh, documents. So in these documents, right, is doc uh, published by Open Data Centers Alliance with a few company including Intel, HP, Walt Disney, and other companies, I can't remember the name. So basically, in this document, talk about um, our, our evolutions of application architecture from physical to cloud, sorry, physical to virtualization to cloud, and also identify some of the key principles when you want to build cloud application, cloud native applications. So some of the key principles are highlighted here. So a cloud native application has to be resilient to failure. And generally, it is composable, so you can build your application in, in, in different components. And it has to be elastically scalable. It can be scaled out and scaled in. And it, it needs to be location independent, so you are in independent from the underlying infrastructures. Because if you don't build your cloud native application in, a, in, in this way, it will, be, it will hinder your, your ability to transition from either private cloud to the public cloud in a hybrid bursting model. 
So if you are, if you are interested to build cloud native application, I would recommend you to read this document. It's very, very useful documents. And you also identify some of the um, strategy that you can ad, uh, apply when moving into the cloud. So um, once you understand the differences between virtualization and cloud, so what kind of strategy can we use to migrate our application to cloud? So when you look at that application, I think very important is you need to understand your architecture. You yourself, have, as architect or developers, you have to understand how your application is going to work. You need to understand where is your data. So most of the time, what I would recommend, or most people, what uh, they're doing today, uh, and, and I would recommend is keep your database in what you have today. Don't migrate your database if you're not familiar with cloud today, especially for those companies new to the cloud. And you can start looking at other components such as um, web tier or middleware or the messaging. Start moving the web tier or middleware tier into the cloud. And it's more like moving bits by bits. Don't do everything in one shot, OK? So uh, because database data is a, is a key, right? You, you can't lose the data. So once you get yourself familiar with how the cloud is going to operate in your environments, then you start planning for the migration for the database. So most of the time, people are moving the web tier and the app tier to the cloud at a, when, when, they, when they first start the journey into the cloud, um, into the open stack. So another thing I want to bring out is the shift of focus. So we want to design a high reliable system. So reliability generally is, is being mentioned or uh, measured in terms of mean time between failure, mean time to repair, and availability. So traditionally, when we build high um, reliable system, we tend to buy very expensive hardware to increase the mean time between failure. I showed this slide before in the, in the, in the, in the Vancouver summit. So um, we use a lot of hardware-based redundancy solutions to achieve high availability. But when we come into the cloud, we kind of like think on, on a different strategy. We can focus more on the mean time to repair, to reduce, I mean, maximize our automations in cloud to reduce the mean time to repair, and use a lot of different um, OpenStack features or cloud features to achieve software-based redundancy to achieve high availability. So it's kind of like shifting our focus. So we, we are moving for away from mean, um, increasing mean time to between failure to reducing MTTR. So it's a, it's a shift of focus bet between on how can we design a high re reliability systems. So demo, okay, next one I'm gonna show is a quick demo. So in this demo, as, I, as, as uh, Steve mentioned earlier, I'm gonna use WordPress as an example. I believe most people understand what is WordPress. And today a lot of company, uh, corporate, they also use WordPress for their corporate website. So um, generally, I mean, WordPress, well, we can argue that it's basically a two-tier application, right? So basically the PHP, everything, and database. Um, you can split the database. But so in this demo, what I'm going to show you is I'm moving the web tier into the OpenStack cloud by keeping the DB intact in your existing environment. So, okay, so what you see on this screen here uh, is a video, basically. Okay, so this is the, the database servers. So uh, this is where the... Uh, the WordPress database is being hosted. So that's IP, internal IP addresses for the database. Um, so I'm just in this uh, uh, screen basically just showing you that uh, there's a database exists. And of course, don't use root. Um, so this database will be used by the web server, which I'll show you later. So there's a show databases, and you can see there's a WordPress database here. And the next screen that you see is the VM in the OpenStack cloud that actually will connect to this particular database. So conventionally, when you design, when you, when you deploy WordPress application in your existing virtualization environment, you do the same thing. So WordPress, you have to configure your WordPress config file, wp-config.php. You basically configure the parameters to point your, data, your WordPress application to the database clusters, right? So I can see here, um, yep, that's the DB name username and very secure password demo one two three and connecting the database host that you see just now. Okay. So this is what we do in the virtualization environment, right? Nothing changed. Uh, nothing special. So we can do the same thing in the OpenStack cloud. And what you see on the user front end, so this is a private IP address for the web servers. And what you see from the user front end basically is nothing different. So basically the website is a very simple website. So there's two, serve, two web servers hosted in the cloud, and there's no, 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 no differences. So you can do the same thing when you want to migrate your WordPress website into the OpenStack cloud, keeping the web, you know, migrate the web into the OpenStack cloud, but keep your database intact in your existing environment. So this is one approach that we can use. So 
But using this approach, we basically fo uh, follow all the P2V approach. We don't, we don't re-architect anything, right? But in this approach, we doesn't gain the best benefit of cloud, okay? So the next demo that I want to show you is a different way of doing things. Uh, what I mean is uh, you can view your application as a different component. So an example is, for, for example, um, um, if, you're, if you're building an e-commerce website, you probably have a building components, you have lock-in components, you have a product catalog, so you probably can start moving your, consider moving your product ca catalog only into the cloud. <coughs> but of course, this kind of model, this kind of approach will require some of a re-architecture or redesign of your application to split your product catalog and move them into the cloud. And um, I'm, again, I'm gonna use the WordPress as examples. So in this uh, WordPress examples, what I'm trying to show you is uh, when you hosted a corporate website, right? So usually you have a content owner that will update the contents, right? And your website visitors basically just read the contents and they visit the website and they read the contents and they don't do any updates to the website. So you basically split, that, split them into two different views. One is for the website viewer and one is for your content owner. So it's in, you, can still, you can still keep your WordPress content owner, uh, those WordPress servers on your local virtualization environment. And, and for the visitor content, the public content, we can, in the WordPress, you can actually use some plugin to convert those into the static content. And in this demo, I'm going to publish those content into the OpenStack object storage, uh, Swift content, the Swift object storage. So the demo basically is a very, very quick demo. Basically, I had wrote a script and read the same WordPress content management system just now. And for every static file, convert them into the static, static, static file, static image, and push them all the way down to the OpenStack cloud. So what I did here behind the scene basically is reading all the WordPress files, static files, and using the OpenStack API to push the content into the Rackspace public cloud. So what you see here basically is reading the file and pushing them into the public cloud using through the API, everything automated. So this is one approach that we can do, especially for, for new adopters when move into the cloud. As you can see here, this is the previous web servers. Nothing special, so when I push the content into the cloud, this is on the, on the Rackspace object storage. So everything looks the same. So the Rackspace, you can use object storage to host all the static content. But for the content update, you can still keep in your WordPress servers on your uh, existing virtualization and do the update and then push the static content into the OpenStack Cloud environments. So this is one approach that we can use. So in if you, uh, another, another advantage of using this approach is like using a push model, especially in coming to a hybrid model. If you deploy your web server, for example, if you deploy a web server in the public cloud, and if you want to keep your database in private cloud, more often you will end up in a security concern because you don't want to expose your database to the public cloud, right? So, another, so the one way you can do is using this kind of approach by pushing the content into the cloud rather than pulling from the internet. So a lot of time when you, when you design your application, your security is, the most, is, is always the first concern, right? So this is one approach that we can use. So when you want to move your application to the cloud, there's always different strategies that you can consider. So don't just restrict yourself to uh, uh, the old way of doing things. So think about a new way, and thinking of the box. So think about the new ways of doing things. There's different multiple approaches that we can use. So these are two very simple examples that we can use. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So with that, I'll pass the time to Steve, talk about some of the 12 factor app. Right, so what we've been looking at so far are things that you could do with an application architecture that re don't require you to, to reach into the internals and start you know, tearing it apart and refactoring the app and things like that. Yeah. Now, there's been a lot of popular discussion for the last couple of years, a company called Heroku that does a lot of mm. excellent work lifting applications into the cloud and providing cloud uh, services for them publish this idea of the 12-factor app. Now, I'm not going to walk you through all of the 12 factors right now or anything. It, if, depending how old you are as a Unix person, a lot of this you look at and you go, well, yes. But putting it all together, it actually helped a lot of people think about how these things can be addressed. Continuing with the idea of WordPress, there was a company that went out and took WordPress and actually turned it into a 12-factor app. Almost. Uh, the, if you go and look for 12-factor 12, 12 uh, WordPress, they have a wonderful, wonderful long blog post that takes you through each of the factors and all of the decisions they had to make. And, and when you look through it, um, some things were absolutely obvious and absolutely easy. 
And those were often the things that we should all be doing with our applications anyway. You know, the idea that everything's under version control. Well, you can kind of check the box on that one. It was very easy to make sure that worked. Um, when you start looking at things like the dependencies, the architecture of the application of WordPress itself already allows you to encapsulate all of that in the composer.json file. Um, but when you start stepping into some of the other things, that's where they started running into problems. Um, one, they had to think their way very carefully through how they handled configuration because a 12-factor app, and the 12-factor apps are kind of that, that step towards doing microservices. Um, well, how do you get things into the environment? They had to be very careful. Some of that stuff belonged in configuration rightly, and some of it you, you needed to get bootstrapped into the environment properly. Um, they ended up replacing Apache with Nginx, because when you start getting into how do you deal with things like sessions, if you're going to go into a stateless world, um, how do you handle things at the concurrency level of port binding? They just needed to literally rip and replace the, the uh, HTTP daemon itself. So when you start thinking about that next step up for how do I get my traditional three-tier app into an OpenStack cloud-enabled world, that's when decisions will start to possibly get a little more expensive. You will have to think about some of the factors. But many of these things are things that you can actually... Um, are just good practices. And these are things that are, you'll, you'll handle culturally rather than technologically. Um, it, it, it's almost, think of it as a different buck, bucket of money in IT um, because you're gonna have to train people differently. So that, that was part of the learning that they went through. Um, I, I, I would encourage you to go and read the blog post because there's, there's lots of depth and detail there that again will hopefully provoke interesting questions for you as you look at your own three-tier applications. Um, that's not the only way to think about it, though. Again, Leong's demo showed you how to bring a lot of your app into an OpenStack-enabled world. And it was dealing with a lot of things that really were infrastructure as a service types of things, things that you know, are, are the core services of uh, OpenStack. But there's other things that OpenStack, as it evolves, has been providing. So you could start to look at things like can you use Trove as a way to handle your database? Um, now, my last experience uh, a few years ago in, on the, the, the IT side of the world, uh, I worked for a company that was, uh, we had a lot of stat static content. Uh, we could do things with Swift. That would have been a, an absolutely excellent way to do things. But our database world had evolved to become so central to the way multiple different applications were feeding off the same collection of tables in the same database. And again, over history, it had been, well, normalized, and then parts of it had been denormalized. And that evolution of what had happened to the database was going to make that evolution to a cloud-based architecture in OpenStack extraordinarily difficult. That was the set of choices that one company had made. Your choices may have been different, but I would encourage you to think carefully when you start brushing up against the database. But you may have an opportunity that um, a class of your applications in your application portfolio, you can lift very easily using Trove. Um, looking at things like if, you, if, if your application is um, conducive to being refactored a little bit and you can start to move yourself into that kind of 12-factor app space and things become a little more stateless, you can start thinking about how you might do containers for that application. Now again, there's, it doesn't require you to do everything absolutely. You may not need to move the entire application into a containerized world using Docker. You may be able to tear it apart and refactor pieces of it and start to move it. So you've got lots of choices here. And I think what Leong and I wa want to do is make sure you're thinking you're not approaching your application portfolio with this mindset that I'm going to have to forklift entire applications one at a time and all of the work that that might be. There's, there's lots of advantage you can get moving into a cloud world and all the cost savings you're going to get that way and the kind of time to deployment and the automation that you'll be able to apply just by doing these things one at a time. I'm going to hand this back to you again. <laughs> Uh, just a very uh, try to wrap up what we're trying to, try, trying to say. So uh, I believe that every technology must create value to business. 
When today, today, if you want to migrate your applications to the cloud, think about what kind of value or what kind of pain point you're trying to solve from the business perspective. You don't just want to migrate for out of no reason. So think about why you want to do that, what is the goal, and what kind of value that you want to create to the business. So I always uh, same thing I mentioned in the previous summit. Every technology must create value to the business. If the technology doesn't create, doesn't add value to the business, it's useless, right? So with that, I think. Um, oops, sorry. I would like to point out that was not me. I am normally the one that is death on hardware in, in any kind of a presentation. And go. go to the call to uh, actually. Let's go to the call to action first, and then we'll handle questions. Okay. So. Uh, Leong and I are part of an OpenStack working group. Uh, the Enterprise Working Group has been wrestling with issues for the better part of a year and a half to two years. Um, there's a number of subgroups in it. One of them is the yes. Cattle and Pets subgroup. And we meet regularly. Uh, that's the mailing list for it and the weekly logistics. Um, I would encourage you to join us. Um, can I have a quick show of hands how many people actually work in Enterprise IT here? Excellent. Wow. Cool. That, that is absolutely excellent. Uh, what we've suffered from for this past year is uh, too many vendors. Yeah. Yes, I am one, and Leong was one of our few. Used to be. Customers. Used to be one of our few true customers from IT. <laughs> and, and we're trying to wrestle with questions like, what are, what are the problems preventing enterprises from moving to OpenStack? And it's a collection of vendor product management engineers going, well, this is what I think they'd have to do. Yeah. We would really encourage you to please come and participate with us. Um, we would like to use this as an opportunity to, to deeply understand the things that we can be carrying back through the product working group and building blueprints that cross projects and such so that we can genuinely begin to evolve OpenStack into ways that will help people uh, in the enterprise space be able to more easily migrate their applications. Yeah, one of the re main reasons for this uh, working group basically you want to um, you want to understand what is your barrier on moving your applications or conventional application, the PATS model, into the cloud. If any problems, any issues, and come join us in the working group, and we'll try to help work in as a community to derive a, to a solutions that can help you to migrate moving into the cloud. So this is our email address. If you guys want to contact yeah. us, you can. I, I am always well. happy to take take email. And before we go to Q&A, and if you're in <laughs> joining the Intel Passport program, do ask, go for Chris, he's over here, you can get a stamp. And with that, we're going to go Q&A. Are there any questions? Please. Do you want to use a mic? Do we have a mic? Yeah. We have a mic. Um, thank you for that. It's pretty interesting. But um, what's the point if you don't actually move the database? Sorry. What What's actually the benefits if you don't move the database? I mean, moving the moving, and I understand that you can sometimes uh, transfer your data. But if we're not dealing with data in OpenStack and we're not yeah. dealing with the with transactional data, are we actually really addressing the enterprise? Well, that's a very interesting question because most of the people come to me and say that. Can we keep the database first without migrating? <laughs> because database is the key, right? Database you know, is very critical to applications, especially for new adopters to the cloud. When you're not so um, familiar with the cloud operation model, the cloud native way, if you start moving a database without understanding the how it works, it give, it's a very high risk to use, right? Of course, I will, I'll be happy to help you to move your database to the, to the, the cloud-based environment. As I say, we plan for the migration. We don't migrate everything at one shot. It's very high risk. From, P from, virtual from, cloud from virtualization to cloud to, to a lot of enterprise IT is a big challenge. So don't do everything at one shot because that's a high risk. It's basically a risk assessment. Of course, definitely you can do database migration. I have no objection. I'm happy to help you on that. But um, for most companies, they, they are very concerned of losing the data. So that's why a lot of companies, a lot of approach, even eBay or PayPal, they're also keeping the database layer in their existing environment and push the web tier and app tier to the cloud first. And slowly, once you get familiar, we start moving you know, the, the database into the cloud. Either use Trove or using the same, building a multiple VM um, SQL clusters in the cloud VM and learn how to adapt the, 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 
Yeah. You, the question speaks exactly to the big problem yeah. because so certainly you can get the scale out benefit at your web tier and even the application tier and that is a huge benefit and a huge step forward depending on the nature of the database and I believe me like I said from my most recent experience on the IT side I realize how fraught that can be depending on the architecture that has evolved over time and how much diligence and rigor may or may not have been applied but in some of the simpler situations you could even use OpenStack today to simply get high availability for your database. Yeah. So it's, you're scaling it differently now, yeah. but you're replicating the database because you can replicate the VMs while you're doing more of a scale out kind of thing on the application tier and the web tier. So you, again, it's that teasing the layers apart and applying different strategies to each of the layers. That is extraordinarily database dependent and I appreciate that, that I'm not suggesting that that was easy or would work for everybody's data environment. If you're really interested in moving database to the cloud, I will encourage you to look into the Trove, the Trove service in OpenStack. That is the database as a service. And a lot of the companies still um, doing POC and have trying to understand how it works before they move on. Sorry. I, I, a comment. I guess it depends on what type of database you're talking about. Exactly. Yes, database support would be critical. Yeah. Um, the difference between if, you, if you've got a, a strongly web-based application and it was yeah. all MySQL based, you're probably in fairly good shape. If you were extraordinarily dependent on a complex Oracle or SQL Server database, yeah. you're going to need to make different yeah. choices. Because today, the, trove, the open source Trove, they only support a few open source databases. If you're working on other databases such as Microsoft SQL or Oracle kind of things, then you probably have to approach the vendor specific solutions yeah. for Trove. Yeah. So that depends on what kind of things you use. Yeah. I, I, I certainly know that from HP's perspective, we've been working with Tesora and they are out in the marketplace yeah. uh, so here and they've done lots and lots of plug-in work yeah. for different databases. Uh, again, I appreciate that we're kind of hand-waving here because of the complexity of the database, but that will probably be where you've, you discover most of the evil things that have evolved in your data environment over the last decade. And, and that's part of the challenge here. Um, you will have some vendors that would, I, you may well have encountered some of my own colleagues, that will tell you, well, you just have to rewrite everything into a cloud-native way. And I realize that so many of the applications we're talking about are business critical applications that you may have done the minimal port from a traditional Unix environment to a Linux environment 12 years ago kind of thing. That these are applications that have been long running, long established. The data environments that move with them are equally complex. And complex not just because the application was complex, but you've made different choices over time. So depending on... <laughs> The, the diligence all the way through the history of that application can really affect your ability to port it. Any questions? Other questions? If not, I'd like to thank you all very much for your time today and your attention. Thank you. Thank you.